Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, we're going to start. Good evening. I want to uh, welcome you, community partners, honorable guests, candidates for the federal election forum on accessibility and disability. Can everyone hear me? No? Can we get some volume, please? Hi, can people hear me now? No? Louder? Can we ask everybody who's talking to please stop talking? Thank you. If people could be quiet, please, in the back. Can people hear me now? Is it better? No, louder? Louder. Can we get louder, please? Can people hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. We welcome you, community partners, honorable guests, and candidates to the Federal Election Forum on Accessibility and Disability. My name is John Massa. I'm the Independent Living Skills Coordinator at the Center for Independent Living in Toronto. I'm also a, a planning committee member for this evening's forum. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that Ryerson University sits on traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nations, and I appreciate their generosity in allowing us onto their territory. This forum has been organized by a great partnership with the following community and community partners. Access Ryerson, Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Alliance for Equality of Blind Canadians, and Johnson Health Station, Arch Disability Law Center, Birchmount Bluffs Neighborhood Center, Canadian Disability Alliance, Canadian Hearing Society, the Center for Independent Living in Toronto, Citizens with Disabilities Ontario, Ethno-Racial People with Disabilities Coalition of Ontario, North Yorkers for Persons with Disabilities, Springtide Resources, and the Toronto Association of the Deaf. Okay, so some basic housekeeping. Uh, for those who have cell phones, please take them out, put them on vibrate, or please turn your cell phone off. This evening, we have five attendants, five ASL interpreters, and a captionist. Washrooms are located both as accessible gender washrooms in the corner to the back right of me, and also there is a single stall universal washroom next to the Starbucks. This is a live presentation which is being recorded. If you're not comfortable with being recorded, please let Heather Willis know she works for Ryerson and is a planning committee member and she's just right behind me. You can live tweet us your questions using the hashtag AxisFEF or follow us on Twitter at Axis Ryerson or at Arch Disability. So the purpose of this forum is for Canadians with disabilities and their allies 
to ask questions to the federal party's representatives about their platforms, policies on disability and accessibility issues so that we can make informed choices on who to vote for on October 19th, the federal election. The moderator for this evening was supposed to be the Honorable David Cianley. However, due to illness, he sent his regrets this morning. We wish him a speedy recovery. In his place, David Lepofsky has graciously accepted to be the moderator this evening. A brief bio on David is that he is on the steering committee for Barrier Free Canada. He is the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act Alliance, and he has brought, he has fought for two successful human rights complaints to force the TTC to audibly announce all bus and subway stops. So I just wanna give a little bit of the ground rules and the format for this evening. So the ground rules, please be respectful of the candidates and one another. Do not use any foul or offensive language. The moderator has the right and the responsibility to ensure respectful discussion from all participants. The format for this evening, the order of candidates has been randomly picked before this forum. The first person to speak will be Arnold Chan, then uh, Mike Sullivan, and then Sharon Danley. All candidates will introduce themselves and provide two minute opening remarks. After the opening remarks, all candidates will be asked six questions and they'll have one minute to respond to each question. After the first question, it will then go in reverse order. The timekeeper will give candidates 10 seconds notice to finish their answer and a final notice that their time is up. After the six questions have been answered, you, the audience, will be given an opportunity to ask a, a time-limited question of 30 seconds uh, per particular candidate. So we can maximize the number of questions for this evening. Candidates will have one minute to respond and the timekeeper will keep track of the time of questions and answers. There'll be two volunteers with roaming microphones. One will be Louis, the other will be Roxanne. And um, the microphones will remain with the roamers who will assist people with positioning of the mics. If you have a 30 second question, please raise your hand, state your name, use the microphones when speaking. If you are unable to raise your hand, please communicate with one of the attendants or microphone roamers that you wish to ask a question. After all the audience questions, all candidates will have a one minute closing remark. At the end, Ryerson University will then thank everyone. So I now pass on the intro of candidates to David Lepofsky. Good evening, everyone. I want to express, extend a special greeting to all our friends who are at Starbucks and to invite them to use sign language to communicate with each other. There's an all candidates debate going on here and we'd appreciate it if you could talk quietly at Starbucks. It tastes better if you talk quietly at Starbucks. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to pretend to be David Onley. I want to get right into tonight's activities. Our three candidates are Arnold Chan for the Liberals. These are proceeding to my right physically, but not necessarily politically. Followed by Mike Sullivan for the NDP. And Sharon Danley for the Green Party. The Conservative Party was actively requested several times and through several ways 
to send a candidate. And indeed, I, who was not part of the organizing committee, tweeted the, the Conservative Party several times to ask that they send someone. We regret that at this point they don't have anyone, but if someone shows up at the last minute, we'll make room for you. I want to begin by inviting our, speak, our candidates who are not running in the same riding and therefore not running against each other to tell us about their party's positions. Two minutes each, starting with the Liberal Party. Please go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you so much, David. And uh, uh, my name is Arnold Chen. I'm the Liberal candidate in uh, Scarborough Aging Court. Uh, but more importantly, I, I first of all want to uh, thank the organizers and the many uh, different groups that have uh, put this uh, particular forum together. I think it is important that we have these conversations uh, as we go through the election uh, so that you can make an informed decision on October 19th. And I also particularly want to thank John and uh, David Lepofsky uh, for, uh, particularly David here who is pinch hitting for uh, the Honorable da uh, David Onley. Uh, I've actually known uh, Mr. Lepofsky now for uh, nearly 20 years. He started out, as you can tell, uh, a particularly funny individual who uh, has, uh, uh, who brings a lot of levity to, uh, to a particular uh, uh, evening like uh, tonight, despite the fact that we have many serious issues to, uh, to talk about. I think the debate today will serve to highlight the importance of, uh, uh, and hopefully advance the cause of creating a truly inclusive and barrier-free society. Uh, I also wanna thank my fellow candidates, at least the ones that showed up from uh, two of the three uh, major political parties uh, for their presence. Uh, I don't particularly wish to be uh, excessively partisan in this particular debate because I think what's really important uh, today is for us to tackle the issues uh, that are facing uh, individuals that have uh, 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 accessibility or disability issues. And so for me, um, beyond simply looking at the policies and positions of the different political parties, I think the other really important uh, component, at least for me, is uh, about perception and about frame of mind. Uh, I had the privilege of being part of the Ontario government. I was a staffer at the time that brought in the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act in 2005. Uh, and, and that act came about, of course, in large part because of David Lepofsky. But uh, I think what was really important for me was that uh, it changed my perspective and my frame of mind for uh, the importance of these issues. And it helped me recognize that we have to move beyond the range of talents and challenges of individuals and to create the conditions that can allow each individual to reach their full potential. I look forward to the debate and your questions tonight. Uh, we'd like to call on Mike Sullivan for the New Democratic Party. Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you, John. Thank you to Arnold and to Sharon for sharing this debate with me and to all of you. Some of you have come very long distances to be here, and I appreciate the fact that you are interested enough to come to this debate and to listen to what the parties have to say about their positions as they affect you and your lives and the lives of your loved ones. Um, we clearly have a long way to go. We signed the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2010, and virtually no action has taken place since it was signed. The Conservative government under Stephen Harper has tinkered on occasion with issues that affect small segments of society, but they have not done anything significant. In particular, they have not done anything to implement the real changes that could come about with the UN Convention. We need to do more to eliminate barriers and to ensure that Canadians are, with disabilities can participate fully in our society. Tom Mulcair and the NDP will introduce a Canadians with Disabilities Act, which will promote accessibility and equality of opportunity with, for Canadians living with disabilities. We will develop a national action plan to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We will work with the provinces, territories, indigenous communities, and the disability organizations to review and coordinate income to supports. And finally, we're going to defend the rights of Canadians with disabilities by reinstating 
the court challenges program and fixing the CPP disability appeals process. Our offer to Canadians is built on clear priorities and that makes sure that means that every Canadian has the opportunity to work and live with dignity and respect. That means all of you in this room and the rest of the 15% of Canadians who are living with disabilities and their families. Thank you very much. We will call on... It's hard in a political context to say, please don't cheer or boo, but I'm eager to get as much time in for everyone, so cheer or whatever quickly. <laughs> Could we now turn to our, uh, our colleague from the Green Party, Sharon Danley, to uh, give a two-minute introduction? Thank you, uh, David, and uh, thank you, Mr. Moza, and my friendly opponents, um, Arnold and Mike. And thank you, everyone, for the uh, honor to come and speak with you this evening. Uh, I'm a, I strongly feel that there is a great need to equalize opportunities for our disabled brothers and sisters. And while I've been able-bodied most of my life, that is changing day by day as I'm becoming less so with every step I take. Both my children were born with disabilities and my darling departed daughter suffered tremendously and required increased care before she passed. So I have a long history uh, in dealing with the bureaucracies and advocating not only for my children but for others with disabilities. Besides having run my own business, I've been involved in some monkey business and I continue to advocate for decades about housing, equality, disabilities, and sexual abuse, all without funding. I work regularly as a volunteer and provide content for social media for people feeling their best around the world. I decided to run in this election because we need to take our country back. We need seriously to address climate change, increasing poverty, failing infrastructure, reduced health care dollars, and we need to make life accessible for everybody. We need well-informed, strong, and respectful MPs representing the people, not chained to party dictates. And that's where the Green Party and Elizabeth May's mantra of respect and working together across party lines is something I also embrace. However this election turns out, you can count on the fact that I will continue with my advocacy work until the job gets done. Thank you. I want to thank all the candidates. The organizers of this event have formulated six excellent questions. To my left, uh, to your right, uh, is uh, uh, Ms. Odelia Bay, a student, a doctoral candidate in disability rights at Osgood Hall Law School. She knows this stuff, and she will read the questions that the organizing committee for this event will, uh, has asked. We will ask one at a time. They will be then directed to, when, after we read the first one, we'll go to, Ms., to Arnold first, Mike second, Sharon third, and then we will rotate in the order in which answered. Answers will be limited to one minute. I am going to modify the rules on two bases when it comes to your questions from the audience, which will be asked after these six. I will grant more than 30 seconds to you if either A, you have a disability which requires you to speak more slowly, or B, after 7 o'clock you include in your question a current score in either the Blue Jays or New York Yankees games. Odelia, question one, please. Roughly 1 million, or 43.8%, of working age adults with disabilities are unemployed. Those who are employed have lower incomes than people without disabilities. Despite having similar education levels, the average employment income for working age adults with disabilities is 22.5% lower than the average employment income for working age adults without disabilities. What are your party's anti-poverty and employment strategies for people with disabilities? And do you support a refundable disability tax credit? If so, when would you implement it? 
Arnold. Uh, the Liberal Party has a strong record of supporting Canadians with disabilities. Uh, we are proud that it was a Liberal government that invested uh, in both employment and income supports for Canadians with disabilities, broadened eligibility for the disability tax credit, and expanded the list of disability supports allowable under the disability supports deduction. Um, I will be frank, we are, are not currently, I'm not in the position to say that we would support a fully refundable disability tax credit, uh, but we are committed to ensuring uh, that we will work uh, to, uh, to broaden uh, supports uh, for uh, uh, those that are subject to accessibility or uh, uh, disability. Furthermore, our, our party and our leader, Justin Trudeau, uh, recognize that uh, 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 individuals with disabilities continue to face uh, significantly higher rates of poverty uh, and employment and less equal access to goods and services, including government services. Uh, we will create new performance standards uh, uh, for, for service offered by the federal government, which will include performance evaluations uh, that will be independently ass assessed and publicly reported uh, dealing with issues of accessibility. And then we will ultimately work with provinces and territories uh, to try to break down barriers uh, for Canadians with disabilities uh, uh, so that we can build an inclusive society. Thank you. By the way, the candidates know that I have approximately 51 inch white cane if they go over time, my aim is pretty good. Sharon. Oh, pardon me, uh, yeah, uh, Mike, sorry, Mike. Uh, our party has committed to an anti-poverty strategy, which will be established in legislation with specific timelines and with the identification of specific populations, including children and persons living with disabilities. We will be acting in legislation to deal with this crisis. We also recognize that the employment insurance program does not assist some persons working with disabilities because A, it's not long enough, and B, it doesn't cover episodic disabilities. We will extend sickness benefits to 45 weeks and include the ability for persons living with disabilities to access for episodic disabilities. In terms of the, um, the refundability of the tax credit, we're not in a position to do that now because there is no agreement on what a definition of a person with a disability is. You can be qualified for Ontario, Ontario disability credits and for Canada pension and not the tax credit. We need Tom. to sort that stuff out first. Thank you. Sharon. Greens endorse a basic income program, which and we urge adoption of as soon as possible as an interim measure. We shouldn't have to live in fear of your benefits being withdrawn. Greens endorse a livable income plan for every Canadian, including those with disabilities, so that nobody lives in poverty or falls below the poverty floor. We also recognize employees with disabilities need concrete supports like transportation, accessibility, both physical and attitudinal, and a variety of other specific needs. So we support a national equipment fund to provide wheelchairs and accessibility tools to fully participate in work and community life. Disabled women suffer sexual harassment more than their able-bodied sisters, so they will stay at their jobs longer because work isn't readily available for disabled women. And another gendered issue is that women have higher unemployment than men, and they are disproportionately victims of violence and poverty as they're over there opposed to their male counterparts. Thank you. Um, for our next question, we will start with Sharon, and then ask Mike, and then final Arnold. While 30.8% of people with disabilities live in rental housing, 44% of renters with disabilities live on low incomes, and this is compared to 24.7% of their renter counterparts without disabilities. What is your party's accessible and affordable housing strategy? Starting with Sharon for the Green Party. Thank you. The Green Party will implement a national housing strategy 
across a broad spectrum of housing needs. Accessibility for the spectrum of disability needs and rights must be part of this strategy. We'll invest in social housing, adapted as necessary to meet particular needs with both rental and purchase options, which is simply an expansion of our national housing program. That program also aims to retrofit current buildings while building new ones. And each person's disability needs will need to be planned from the ground up and consultations with a disabled person is essential in this process for all the obvious reasons. Arnold. Uh, liberals understand that uh, affordable housing is an important solution uh, facing the challenge of many of our communities. Uh, it can also provide much needed stability to people with disabilities or serious health conditions. Uh, as part of our new proposed 10-year investment of nearly $20 billion in social infrastructure, uh, we will pro prioritize significant new investments in affordable housing in seniors' facilities. Uh, this, will investment, this investment will renew federal leadership in housing and help build more housing units and refurbish existing ones. Uh, we will also renew our current cooperative agreements uh, and provide operational support to municipalities, including renewing support for Housing First initiatives that help homeless Canadians find housing. We will also direct the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, along with the new Canada Infrastructure Bank, uh, to provide financing to support construction for pri uh, by the private sector, uh, social enterprises, co-ops, and not-for-profit sector of new affordable rental housing for middle and low-income Canadians. Mike. The NDP has committed to continuing the money that was being set aside for the housing agreements. The Conservative government has begun to cut it. Well, actually, the beginning of the cuts of housing agreements started under the Liberal government of Paul Martin, who abandoned the National Housing Program and gave it to the provinces to administer, and then the provinces in this province gave it to the City of Toronto, who don't have enough money to provide the housing that they need to provide. We'll put $2.7 billion back into the housing, including $500 million directly for the construction of new affordable and accessible housing in the cities of this country. We intend to have a national partnership between ourselves and the provinces and the municipalities on the issue of housing to ensure that the wait times have, can shrink and that the, uh, the quality of the housing can be maintained. The CMHC will play a big role in rolling out this strategy, and we hope to start this in our very first year in office. Okay, our next question is going to go to Mike first, just so you can be all ready. Any system that permits euthanasia or assisted suicide but that provides minimal legislated safeguards will leave many vulnerable persons at risk of losing either their lives unnecessarily or their autonomy over personal life and death decisions or both. What is your party's position on physician assisted dying and what safeguards will your party consider? Sorry, we'll start with Mike, then Sharon, then Arnold. Thank you. This, of course, is one of the very toughest of questions in this entire list of questions, but we do want to ensure that we consult with each and every uh, disability organization and disability groups. The party has already adapted strategies in some provinces, including that we cannot proceed down the road of permitting physician-assisted suicide without all of the uh, supportive facilities already being in place. And that means long-term care. That means seniors' long-term care. That means palliative care. And until those things are in place, we can't even have the discussion about physician-assisted suicide. It, we have committed to $30 million towards palliative care as a first step, but we understand the ruling of the Supreme Court means that we have to act. 
but we will not act without consulting and listening to all of the affected groups, including persons living with disabilities. Sharon. It's a very slippery slope with strong division. Who decides what the quality of life is? Bottom line, many with disabilities fear this could be the state's way of backing out of supports or palliative care. It has been shown that people who acquire disability later on tend to be in favor of assisted death. People born with disabilities don't favor this stance. However, those in unbearable pain at the end of their lives have repeatedly sought a court ruling that the provisions of the criminal code prohibiting physician-assisted death must be adjusted. The Green Party is ready, having already accepted this compassionate position. We will, however, remain vigilant against any attempt to allow any acceptance that any person can make such a decision for another person. We can no longer leave family members in the moral and legal quandary of assisting their loved ones to a peaceful death with dignity. The Green Party will support changes to the criminal code to allow for physicians to assist death in limited cases and circumstances involving adults with mm -hmm. full mental capacity. Arnold. Liberal, oh, sorry. Liberals recognize that we need to have a respectful and responsible conversation about strengthening end-of-life care and support, including palliative care. Uh, we support federal collaboration with the provinces and territories to tackle critical needs, including end-of-life care, community-based care, and elder care. Because of the Supreme Court of Canada decision uh, earlier this year, uh, the Liberal Party does recognize that the issue of physician-assisted death is a complex issue and that any legislation requires extensive consultation to reflect the values of Canadians and the rule of law. Uh, as a result of that decision, and because of government, uh, Conservative Party in action, uh, our leader, Justin Trudeau, actually introduced a motion in Parliament uh, to ask for immediate action and to appoint a special committee uh, to consider the ruling of the Supreme Court uh, so that we could uh, have that important conversation uh, with Canadians. Unfortunately, it was voted down by the Conservative majority. We are going to now proceed to the, uh, the next question, and it will go to Arnold first, then Mike, then Sharon. People with disabilities rarely enter politics, even though 13.7% of the Canadian population has some form of disability, only 0.01% of candidates in the past three elections in every province had a disability. What is your party's record of seeking candidates with disabilities? And how many candidates with disabilities in your party are running in this current election? Starting with Arnold. Uh, we are uh, very much uh, uh, recognized and are committed to, uh, um, first of all, within our party and open nominations process. But we are committed to encouraging people of uh, disabilities, uh, accessibility issues, minorities, um, uh, 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 people of, 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 uh, of gender, uh, whatever, in terms of seeking a nomination within, uh, within our open nominations process. And uh, I am pleased uh, to, to note that uh, in this federal election, uh, the Liberal Party does have three candidates that uh, uh, are running for us. Uh, we have Kent Hare, uh, who is running in Calgary Centre, who uses a wheelchair. Uh, and uh, previously had been a successful former uh, MLA, uh, m in uh, Alberta. Uh, we have Carla Quattro, in, who is running for us uh, in uh, Delta in British Columbia, who is visually impaired and has competed in two Paralympics. And finally, we have Colin Wilson, who is running in Barrie, Innisville, who uses a wheelchair and is an active community volunteer and a senior advisor within the uh, Federal Public Service. Mike. Okay. Can I make sure Mike has the... I have a mic now. Um, the NDP, as far as I know, is the only party that has a committee whose job it is to advise the members of Parliament and the caucus on issues with respect to persons living with disabilities. That committee also 
has created a fund to assist persons living with disabilities to seek office. That fund is administered by that committee and goes to people who want to be candidates for nomination. In addition, the party has very strict rules about nominating meetings. Those meetings cannot be held without there first being an equity-seeking uh, process ahead of the nomination. The, the uh, riding associations must check and see who out there wants to run for us before they're permitted to have the nomination meeting, and that includes persons living with disability. I put forward a private member's bill seeking the federal government to provide funding for candidates. It has not failed. It has failed. We also have five persons living with disabilities running for the NDP in this federal election. Thank you. Sharon. Greens believe everyone deserves an equalized opportunity out of the starting blocks, so to speak. It's about the ability to do the job, too. Candidates also need added reimbursement costs, such as accessibility vans or a sign language interpreter that would travel door to door. Our party supports all candidates with disabilities, regardless of whether they are lifelong or acquired. And we support their right and need to have every tool available for success. We too have five candidates with disabilities. Nick Carter, Maureen Green, Nicholas Wendler, David Clow, and John Reddens. And I'm an example of a person becoming less able-bodied through natural aging. We walk our talk at the Green Party with or without an assistive device. Thank you. Our next question will go to Mike first, then Sharon, then Arnold. More than four million Canadians with disabilities experience accessibility barriers in areas in which the Canadian government has jurisdiction. This includes things like air travel, banking, telecommunications, broadcasting, and federal government services like mail delivery. For people with disabilities, barriers can be physical, limiting access to buildings, technological, preventing full use of federal government websites, legal, like laws that unfairly limit people with disabilities from immigrating to Canada, or attitudinal, unfair stereotypes about people with disabilities that limit access to employment in opportunities in the workplace. Will your party make a commitment to the creation of a Canadians with Disabilities Act to address barriers to full citizenship and societal participation? Who will you consult and what would be the time frame? Starting with Mike. Yes, we will be bringing forward in our first year a Canadians with Disabilities Act. We will be consulting widely with disability organizations but the intention of this act will to be to enshrine in law the rights and responsibilities of the federal government towards persons living with disabilities. No longer will, uh, we hope, will individuals with disabilities and their organizations have to take the federal government to court in order to get the human rights code enforced. It needs to be enshrined in law, and we fully recognize and accept that. We are also aware that there are a number of government services that are not fully accessible, and those government services include door-to-door -door mail delivery. We have committed to restoring door-to-door -door mail delivery in those locations that where the Conservative government has allowed it to be removed. Sharon. Greens firmly support the idea that all people have a right to attend anything with full accessibility. According to the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, slightly more than half of Canadian children with disabilities do not have access to need, needed aids and devices. We support a national equipment fund. Every person with a disability has a right to devices and assistance to help them live fully and independently as possible, so as to be able to participate within society for work, play, and all facets of community. Greens will work to create a Canada Disabilities Act and implement it. 
Smart and well-managed programs consult with people and their supporters actually using the devices. And Greens will consult with people with disabilities and those that work with them and their allies along with everyday Canadians. Arnold. Although uh, my party has not committed yet to uh, Canadians with Disabilities Act, uh, I, uh, should I have the privilege of being re-elected uh, to Parliament, will advocate continually within my party so that we do adopt that position. Uh, I know that a number of my other colleagues uh, also feel strongly about this particular position uh, and that we will move forward uh, towards uh, uh, hoping that the Liberal Party will adopt the position of the uh, Canadians with Disabilities Act. Uh, having, as I mentioned earlier, uh, being part of uh, the Ontario government, uh, I've seen the uh, attitudinal shift uh, that has taken place as a result of the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians for Disabilities Act. Uh, and I think that it's high time as well that uh, this particular position be adopted at the federal level. I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative to ask Arnold one quick follow-up. I tweeted you today asking if you would ask your leader, Justin Trudeau, to make a commitment for a Canadians with Disabilities Act. Will you ask him? I will ask him that question. Will you tweet us that you did? When I have done so, I will tweet it. Thank you. Our last question, which will go to uh, Sharon, and then Arnold, and then Mike. A reminder that this question is in two parts. So, part one. Although in March of 2010, Canada ratified the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities with the support of all provinces and territories and on the basis of a unanimous resolution of the House of Commons, Canada has not provided the necessary leadership to implement the convention. Federal leadership is required on the implementation of the convention, which touches on many disability and accessibility issues under federal, provincial, territorial, or shared jurisdiction. What is your party's commitment to take action to implement the convention in collaboration with provinces and territories and in close consultation with disability representative organizations? Let's start with Sharon. A pillar of the Green Party is equality, and that's for everyone. Greens believe in equalizing opportunities for everyone, no matter their ability or disability. A Canadian Disabilities Act will express Canadians' vision of a more equitable society rather than the current confusion resulting from the municipality of acts, standards, policies, and programs that prevail. It's like in every other bureaucracy, your head spins and the confusion is much lost as a result. To better understand the underlying factors, the Council of Canadians with Disabilities and the Canadian Association for Community Living commissioned the Caledon Institute of Social Policy to study the situation and proposed solid, doable solutions, some of which I've mentioned earlier. Arnold. It is uh, completely unacceptable that after four years uh, since Canada ratified the Convention uh, for Peoples with Disabilities, we are still waiting for meaningful federal action. Uh, the Liberal Party pledges to fully implement uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, after consulting with provinces and territories and stakeholder organizations uh, to take um, a substantive action to address the barriers faced by Canadians with disabilities. Uh, for example, we will uh, support equal access to published works for those who are visually impaired through, among other measures, implementing the mandatory limitations and exceptions to copyright rules consistent with the uh, Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, we will uh, take these particular principles seriously so that Canadians can fully participate in all aspects of our societal life. Mike. We have committed to drafting and implementing an implementation plan for the UN Convention. And that will be in concert with persons living with disabilities, disability organizations, the provinces, the territories, municipalities, and indigenous governments, because they all have a stake in persons living with disabilities. We also will designate an independent monitoring and complaints mechanism 
so that Canadians living with disabilities have a way to draw attention to the areas in which the government or whichever government is not complying with the Convention. We will also remove Canada's reservation on Article 12 of the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which means that there won't be um, a substituted decision-making process in Canada. We need to make sure that the, without subjecting those arrangements to independent review. We are committed to implementing fully the UN Convention, and we will do that as soon as we are elected. I want to thank the organizing committee for having formulated six excellent questions that capture all a wide range. Oh, sorry, part two. They captured it all except for what they did in part two, which is even better. All right, and with the anticipation then of the better question. Following from the first part of the question, Canada has not signed rat or ratified the Convention's optional protocol. The optional protocol establishes an individual complaints mechanism. If signed, Canada would agree to recognize the competence of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to consider complaints from individuals or groups who claim that their rights under the Convention have been violated. Will your party make a commitment to sign and ratify the optional protocol of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and what would the time frame be? This is one that doesn't take long for you to each answer. Let's do it fast. I'm going to start with Arnold. Will you ratify the optional protocol, and can you give us a time frame? Yes, immediately upon forming the government. Mike? Yes, immediately. Sharon? Yes. Are you sure you guys don't disagree on anything? <laughs> well done. Uh, the the uh, excellent questions from the organizing committee have now been asked. It's up to you to start asking. And the Blue Jays are at, are, uh, at play, so you can get more time by telling us the score. Could we first go to microphone number one? Microphone number one, do you have a question for us? 30 seconds for the question, one minute each candidate for the answers. We can't hear you. Just hold on. Our AV person, we are not getting sound from microphone number one. Is microphone number two working? I, I think it's working now, David. Okay. Hi, I'm John Ray, Council of Canadians with Disabilities. Uh, since the organizing committee already asked our first priority question about a refundable DTC, I'm going to ask about the electoral process. And to all candidates, for me as a blind person, to be discriminated against again when I go to vote because I cannot independently verify how I voted. In addition, the Elections Act does not cover such areas as access to uh, campaign offices, campaign literature, and all candidates meetings. My question then is, what's in your party platforms regarding making the electoral process more accessible to all Canadians with disabilities? Can we start with Mike, then Sharon, then Arnold? Our um, party has a committee whose job it is to ensure that the party platform includes such things as you ask for. And our platform includes making sure that voting, that participation in the electoral process is accessible to all Canadians. Right now, there is no provision to provide funding for persons who are candidates for office to allow them to have such things as interpretation, as assistance, as uh, other parts of what is required by persons living with disabilities that is not required by other Canadians. We have already begun the process of making sure that those things are brought to Canada. They exist in other countries. They need to be here in Canada. We need to be living in the 21st century, not back in the 18th century. Sharon, uh, what's your party prepared to do to make the voting process and the election process fully accessible for voters with disabilities? We are, again, f uh, totally believe in equality all the way around and total accessibility. 
Uh, we are a party that doesn't have much money, but we help where it's grassroots. We will do what we can to help anybody get to the polls. In any help that they need, we will give that to them. In the Council of Canadians that will be dealing with the disability issues, all of these factors will be brought in, and we count on your community to tell us yourselves exactly what it is you need rather than us telling you. Well, uh, under the Liberal Party, we've uh, attempted to make, uh, for example, our, our website uh, far more accessible. So, for example, someone who's unable to uh, read it you or unable to actually use a mouse, um, it is, um, uh, voice, there is voice recognition software that allows uh, it to be, uh, to be read to you. Um, in terms of some of the, the broader questions that you raise, um, uh, you, you're absolutely correct. There currently isn't a framework in which uh, that uh, can be addressed, and I think that's part of the necessary review that we must ultimately undertake uh, to make sure that uh, people with uh, uh, accessibility or disability issues can fully participate in our democratic process. Question for, question for uh, microphone number two, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is David. Uh, I've got a two-part question for you uh, that relates to... Uh, election accessibility. So my, the first half of my question is this. I've attended uh, various campaign events, et cetera, throughout the past several weeks uh, during this election. And as a hard of hearing person, I have a, a need for accessibility services such as interpreters or captioning or whatever. And it seems like it's impossible to get through to the central campaign committees um, any sort of accessibility requests. So you guys need to do something on your websites or whatever to allow for uh, citizens to make private requests for accommodations. You don't have it, you need to fix it, you, may, you need to make it happen now. Second half, of, second half of my comment, and this is gonna lead to the actual question. Um, I received an email some time ago from one of the parties that uh, pointed me to a video with that particular party's leader being interviewed by Peter Mansbridge. Beautiful, wonderful video. It was sitting on the CBC website, whatever, but it's not captioned and hasn't been captioned yet. This was several weeks ago. It's still not captioned. My question is, this is the public broadcaster. This is Radio Canada, CBC. They want to sell their buildings. I think they've got a more critical problem with accessibility. What is your party going to do to make sure that all media... You've out. gone way over 30 seconds. We got it. CBC accessible websites, accessible all candidates debates. Let's start with uh, Mike. Well, I, as a person who used to work at CBC, I'm uh, appalled that the CBC has not made that accessible. And if it was our party, our party works very hard to make sure that any video we put up is captioned when it's put up or very shortly thereafter. We are aware that that is something that we have to do and I chase after those people all the time, as does our committee. In terms of the, uh, the, the, the overall uh, accessibility issues, I like your comment that there needs to be a private request for accommodation available and I'm going to make that recommendation directly to the party. Sharon. I too used to work at CBC, <laughs> and I too am ashamed that it isn't fully accessible as it should be. I agree that everything should be captioned. Everything that we do in the public broadcaster should be available and accessible in all ways. We are in the process of upgrading, updoing the best that we can. As I said, we are a small party with very limited funds and we're doing the best we can, we do it grassroots, and I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. And please, if there's anything else, let us know so that we can improve. Arnold. Unlike my two fellow candidates, I have not worked for the CBC, but my father did <laughs> for 30 years. Uh, I too uh, join them in, in echoing their comments. So let me simply get to the, the, the first part of your question. Uh, I too will make that commitment to ask my party to make sure that uh, private accommodations are met uh, uh, 
when we become aware of it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, mic number one. I am going to enforce the 30-second rule, so mic number one, please, if after 30 seconds, if I say time's up, can you please let the rest of the sentence come out, and then let's carry on. Please, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, my question is this. I uh, take the train frequently, and I also use Air Canada a couple times. And one of the things I found is that you can run into maybe a plane that's, well, the plane is not accessible in that you have to travel with somebody. On the train, the train itself is okay. The washrooms are not great. But the question I have is, when you get to stations, they have been privatized or sold to some other, there's someone else's responsibility. So is going to do to ensure that we not only can take these federal government regulated um, travel options, but also be able to use the washrooms and the facilities at each of the stations along the way. Thank you. The right to interprovincial travel and interprovincial bladder emptying. Could you each please address those rights which <laughs> others take for granted, starting with Arnold. Interestingly, as someone who's just recently survived cancer, I'm uh, particularly sensitive to the need to get to uh, quickly accessible facilities. Um, I absolutely, I simply am just going to be blunt. I, I agree with you, and I think that's exactly why we ultimately will need that federal review. I, I saw what, uh, and, and I did listen, hear what Mike had to say with respect to even the um, AODA, uh, that, uh, that the implementation of uh, the kinds of standards is perhaps far too slow and that we need a faster uh, timetable to get that done. But I, I agree with you. Mike, it took, <clears throat> it took a court challenge to get Via Rail to agree that their vehicles weren't accessible. And then the Conservative government cut back their funding, so they slowed down the creation of those accessible vehicles. That's not acceptable. We, as a federal government, will make sure that all Canadian transportation systems are as accessible as they need to be to make sure that persons living with disabilities can use them in the same manner that everyone else can use them. There is no excuses, no way that this should be delayed because of funding requests or because somebody said, it, as they did in Ontario, they said, we don't have to do it now because we have a deadline of 2024. That doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for persons trying to travel on the GO train here in Ontario. We need to access the facilities now and we need to start working on it five years ago. I agree with my friendly opponents here. <laughs> I really do and I think our biggest problem is the current government. That's what's stepping in the way. I think, I think most of us feel we have the will. We want to make sure that the things that are, have been written in place will be done and implemented and full accessibility everywhere will happen. But we need to make our votes count, folks. I'm going to send the mic, uh, go to mic number two, but can I give an alert to mic number one? Could you please check to see if there's any questions on Twitter? If you're watching this being streamed live around the world on the internet, a tweeted question using the uh, hashtag a uh, access number sign and then the word access F E F will be monitored and we'll try to get your question. So question mic number two and then mic number one, please be ready with a Twitter question if there is one. Okay, I do have a sorry. My mistake, mic two. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Frank Foligno and I'm from the Canadian Association of the Deaf, uh, which represents Canadians who are uh, both ASL and LSQ. I listened to your presentation and I do have a few comments and questions. 
The UN CRPD has uh, seven different uh, parts in which it mentions its language, and specifically sign language. And so I'm wondering whether or not, from that, uh, we have different countries, Sweden, Finland, um, Albania, uh, Slovak Slovakia, many different countries have already passed legislation recognizing uh, sign languages within an act to help improve the quality of life for people who are deaf within those countries. Employment, education, health, interpreting services, so on and so forth. So to you my question is, will you commit to introducing and supporting rec a recognition within legislation of the uh, sign languages that we use in Canada, both American Sign Language and Quebec sign, sign Language. And that would be uh, within the framework of the Canadians with Disabilities Act. Thank you. Let's ask Sharon first, then Arnold, then Mike. Again, absolutely, it should be included. Uh, the, accessibility in every way, shape, and form is important. And bringing it to the attention of the party who's in power is essential. And I'm, again, with my friendly opponents here, I believe that we're all wanting to make sure that everything is fully accessible in every way possible. Working across party lines like the Greens like to do, working together, I have seen no reason why it can't be done. In order to fully implement the, uh, uh, the UN Charter, uh, the answer is a simple one, yes. The UN Charter and the Canadians with Disability Act will both work to ensure that sign language, both ASL and QSL, are universally accessible to everyone. It's more than just calling it a, an official language, which is, I know, what some in the, in the deaf community want us to do. It is actually making sure there is funding available, making sure there is uh, resources available for the deaf community to be able to have the, their languages interpreted in the language of their choice, whether it's ASL or QSL. You can't do that without, without actually recognizing that those languages exist and making sure that those languages are recognized. Arnold. Oh, you already did, sorry. Sorry, we're covered. We got everybody? We got everybody, sorry. Um, by the way, um, on behalf of the organizing committee, I want to offer everybody at Starbucks who doesn't talk for the next hour a free Glopacino. <laughs> Could we go to mic number one for a Twitter question? So this question is coming from Mark Workman, and it's for all candidates. NDP is committed to bringing back the Court Challenges program. Will the Liberals and the Greens make a similar commitment? And uh, for Mr. Sullivan, I suppose a comment? Okay, so let's start with uh, Arnold. Will you bring back the Court Challenges program? Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, Frank, I'm not in a position right now to make that particular commitment, uh, but I will review it with, uh, with my party. Mike, anything you want to add where your party's on record that they will? We will, and uh, of course we are well aware of the difficulties that are being faced because the Conservative government is presently doing everything in their power to remove those court challenges that still exist and to try and stop them. So we will allow them to continue and we will reinstitute the court challenges program. Sharon. Removing the government will remove the problem. <laughs> By the way, Mark Workman is a friend. He's in Alberta. We are having our voices heard across the country. Microphone number two, could we have a question? And again, please, 30 seconds if you can. Okay. Um, good evening. And David, I have an update for you on the Jade game, if that'll give me more time. It will. <laughs> they were drained out tonight. But there's a doubleheader tomorrow starting at 4 in Baltimore. So there you go. Does that make you happy? <laughs> so now my question to the, um, the attendee, thank you for, for coming. The question I have is related to the economy. And we know that tourism is a very big player when it comes to the economy of Canada to contribute, contributing. So the thing, the area that I've been working in is an inclusive tourism, making tourism accessible to people with disabilities, their families, their friends, their caregivers and such. 
So what did your party have in mind in terms to bolster um, tourists coming to Canada and traveling within Canada to make it more accessible and provide a boost to the economy, given that the, the baby boomers are aging as well? We're going, to, we're going to start with Mike, and just because it's kind of noisy here, to repeat again, to increase the accessibility of Canada as a tourist destination for one billion people with disabilities around the world, what, uh, what would your party be prepared to do? Starting with Mike, then Sharon, then Arnold. If, if we as a country are accessible to our own people, it will also follow that we will be accessible to everyone else in the planet. I have b traveled to a number of cities where accessibility is the norm. In Hong Kong, for example, there is braille on the handrails in the subways so that individuals can navigate using braille. There are yellow uh, bumps on the, on the ground marking out pathways, not just marking out the edges of the platforms, but marking out pathways so that individuals who are sight impaired can actually find their way around. Um, Canada should and could be a world leader and if we are a world leader, we will attract many people to this country. And, and it is a, a wonderful economic opportunity and a wonderful opportunity that you've brought to my attention. Thank you very much. And it's 2 nothing Boston over New York. Good stuff. Sharon. <laughs> One billion disabled around the world. Canada has a real problem with infrastructure. We need to rebuild fix, retrofit, etc., and in the process of that, making everything fully accessible. Let's get the job done and get it done right for everyone. Arnold. I uh, absolutely agree with you, the, uh, and frankly with my fellow candidates, that uh, there is a significant opportunity if we make our society accessible that uh, uh, we will simply continue to attract the very best from around the world. Part of I think also my criticism of the existing Conservative government has frankly simply been the lack of investment uh, in, in tourism opportunities uh, in this country. For example, uh, the Conservative government for a number of years cut all advertising uh, with respect to uh, Destination Canada, advertising that was focused in the United States. And certainly it should be broadened uh, to uh, provide a broader range of, of opportunities uh, for uh, enjoying Canada's wonderful uh, uh, diversity that we, uh, that we happen to have here. Okay, the next question, we're going to go over to microphone number one, and I think, Sharon, you're going to be the first at bat. Not to mix metaphors. Help me? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Cheryl Boswell. I'm from the Youth Mental Health Action Group, and I brought the first case of mental health discrimination in the school system to a human rights tribunal in Canada. We're waiting for the decision. Um, so many Canadians are affected by mental illness. One in five have a mental illness this year. Yet less than one third get help. It's even worse for children and youth with 75% not being treated and suicide being the number one health risk. The reality for youth is that they are not getting the services and supports that they require in healthcare and education to meet their needs and to keep on living. We want to know, not the announcements, and so far it's only Thomas Small Care that has made an announcement on children and youth mental health. We want more than announcements, despite our, in spite of all of our fundraising efforts across Canada. There is not a difference in outcomes. We wait for more than one year for any health care supports and services. This is inhumane. It's unbelievable that in Canada okay. we do not get immediate, uh, immediate medical Time's assistance. Up. Youth mental health, not just promises, action. Sharon. Again, remove the government we have and you remove a big part of the problem. The Greens are committed to dealing with mental health and bringing it into the fore, and especially for young people, so that they can get their needs met. And when you remove poverty, when you reduce hugely tuitions for young people, when you take care of society as it needs to be taken care of, 
you start to eliminate the causes of mental illness as well, or some of the causes. Arnold. Yeah. In terms of, of, I think, again, I, I will echo some of what Sharon said, remove the conservative government and make sure that there are um, adequate transfers uh, going to uh, the provinces uh, so that they can actually meet their, uh, their health care uh, their health care commitments we've seen uh, reductions take place uh, in the, both the Canada health transfer that they've capped uh, the Canada health transfers going to the uh, provinces and territories uh, and have limited it from what had previously been under the CH CHT escalator of six percent they've now reduced it down to uh, uh, just the, uh, just to the rate of inflation uh, it's important that uh, that we also of course work on a national uh, mental health strategy uh, to deal with the kinds of issues that uh, you're talking about. Mike. The funding of health care is one of the federal responsibilities, but the delivery of health care is the provincial responsibility. The provincial government in Ontario has been reducing the uh, uh, supports for mental health in this province for the past 10 years, and the federal government hasn't called them out on it. We haven't said to them, well, we're not going to fund you anymore unless you provide health care. The Canada Health Act is quite a powerful tool, but we need a government at, the, at Ottawa that actually isn't afraid to challenge the provincial uh, delivery system. We need a federal government in Ottawa that is actually prepared to take, as Tom Mulcair has indicated, take steps to ensure that when uh, parts of the health care system are failing us, like the pharma care system is currently failing us, like the mental health care system is currently failing us, that the federal government takes action, takes immediate action to sort the problem out and to make sure the provinces are delivering on what they are, what they are supposed to deliver to every Canadian. Okay, before I go to the next microphone, I just want to explain that when I cut off questioners, I don't want to seem in any way insensitive. It's hard to cram the question in. We're just trying to get as many people in, and, and I'm, that's why I'm doing it. Uh, is it mic number two is next? Mic number two. No, mic number two. Mic number two. Mic number one, look over, see if we got any more Twitter action while we're, while we're at mic number two. Okay, mic number two. Hi, my name's Scott Simpson. I want to thank the three candidates for showing up tonight. Much appreciated. This is an important event. In 1998, I was diagnosed with HIV. The reason I'm alive and millions of other people across this planet are alive is because of HIV research and treatment. The treatment is so effective, in fact, that I became a member of the national triathlon team. So I've represented Canada at three triathlon world championships. Now in 2012, I came down with myalgic encephalomyelitis, which very simply put is inflammation of the head or brain and spinal cord. So there's and now, because of myalgic encephalomyelitis, I can barely walk my old dog around the block. So, there are about 71,000 people in Canada living with HIV. There are 410,000 people in Canada living with myalgic encephalomyelitis, so five times as many. There's 13.1 million invested so far this year in HIV research, and there is zero dollars invested in myalgic encephalomyelitis. So my question to you is, what is your government going to do about the lack of biomedical research funding for myalgic encephalomyelitis? Right. Go Thank first. you. Arnold first. I think we simply need to get a federal government that's back in the business of actually recognizing the importance of um, evidence-based um, science. I, I can't speak to the specific uh, instance that you're, that, you're, that, you're, that you're calling for. Uh, that will ultimately have to be determined by uh, uh, whomever's uh, the Minister of Health. Uh, but we, we need to get a federal government back into, the, into funding primary research of all kinds. Uh, and, and in terms of making sure that we have evidence-based a decision making coming out of the, the federal government, which is something that has been sorely lacking from the existing government. Mike. That is a very specific question. And unfortunately, I didn't come here with that answer. But this government has decided that research is only to be conducted if it has some kind of profit potential for some company. That's the current government's approach to all uh, research, whether it's research on transportation, research on uh, drugs, research on medical systems, 
their view of the world is that it only is worth doing if there is somehow a profit to be made. And clearly, base, pure research that is done at the universities, that is done in labs across this country, is not something that is designed for profit. We need to move back to that model. We need to, we need to change the government in Ottawa. Sharon. Sure. Thank you. My friend points out a, a, a good point. Um, we, we, we have to, when we talk about money and profits, we have to include the cost to people and other species on this planet. How do we put a dollar value on people's well-being and health? So, I can't give you a specific answer on that either, but certainly it comes under bringing back science, bringing back uh, research, all of the things that are important to make everyone's life fuller, richer, healthier. Okay, we're going to go to mic number one for a, uh, a Twitter uh, submission. The question will go to Mike first. And when we get over to question, microphone number two afterwards, just remember the person on Twitter only has 140 characters to put their whole question. Go to Mike, okay, mic number one. Okay, so this question is from the account Civil Rights Now. The question is, will you support legislation to amend the Canada Health Act to include science-based autism treatment under Medicare? Very good. Mike? Yes. The Canada Health Act, and there, there already is an autism strategy bill that was passed by this past House of Commons. Um, I have run into many pa parents at the door who are now um, actually becoming impoverished because of the cost of autism for their families. And I believe that science-based research is something that ought to be part of the Canada Health Act. I believe that, or, or at least that the, that the government should be paying attention as it pertains to the treatment and development of treatment protocols for health in Canada, that the Canada Health Act needs to be enforced by the federal government. Uh, Sharon. I agree with my friend. It has to be enforced. Money has to be put back into research and everything uh, that is necessary to improve the health and well-being of everyone. Arnold. I'll be quick. Yes. Let's go back to mic number two. And then mic number one, I'm going to ask you for another Twitter question after that. Mic number two, please. Hello. It's me. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Ten months after I was born, I got polio. I entered Canada here as a handicap, and thank God now, anytime we have to cross immigration, we use our passport. But anytime we have to go to offices to use uh, social service, wherever we are using a social insurance number, and there is this ignorance about us being uh, uh, disabled or a person that has the disability. Recently, I applied for a chair. This is my second chair, and uh, they told me uh, they don't feel I need a chair. Let, so let's put it as a question, it has to do please. With an, I, pardon me? Could you, sorry, could I get you to ask a question specifically, please? Yeah, what can you do to help us identify ourselves when we go to offices? Okay, we're going to start with... Who did I say with the question is, what can be done to help someone identify themselves as having a disability when they go to a government office for services? Can we start with Sharon? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I totally sympathize with you. Uh, <laughs> getting needs met uh, at a lot of these uh, government offices, ODSP, etc., there seems to be a culture that isn't willing to help. I've run across it myself. Uh, I've heard stories from other people. There is an attitude that needs to change drastically. And I'll tell you, that's something, when you have a good attitude and you're treated with respect and you're honored with your needs, changes everything. Arnold. I, I understand the challenge with respect to frontline service and that ultimately what we need is an attitude change. Uh, Again, if we bring in the appropriate legislation, I think simply frontline workers, part of their performance evaluation needs to be on those types of service issues, that in fact that they 
um, recognize that they ultimately need to provide service to everyone uh, with a smile. Mike, the, um, the notion that uh, uh, we have about 15 different definitions of what a person with a disability is in terms of the 15 different government supports points to the fact that we need a conversation at the provincial, federal, territorial, indigenous groups level and with all the disability committees to ensure that we have the same definition all across the system. We don't, we have a different definition for CPPD, we have a different definition for the uh, uh, ODSP here in Ontario and I'm sure in every other province there's a different definition. We need to be able to uniformly be able to say that a person has a disability and that disability requires assistance and that disability requires accessibility and accessibility to government services is part of that. Without the conversation though between ourselves and at the federal level and the provinces and territories and the disability rights groups, we're never going to get there. And so far this government has not had a conversation. It's time we had that conversation. Mike number one, please. Do you have a Twitter question or one from the audience? From the audience. Go for it. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Johnny. Um, as a recent visually impaired citizen, it's been a struggling adjustment ex experience to acquire the rights for the needs of accommodations, which others as a privilege. Uh, social attentiveness enables legislation to become sound within a democracy. So how will you successfully spread awareness, aid, and accommodations for various disabilities to the general mass public? So in other words, not just what are you going to do about laws, but what are you going to actually do to change what people do? Um, let's start with uh, Arnold. I think that's sort of the point I was trying to get at it in my opening statement, which is we need an attitude change, and we, we all, all of us, particularly those of us who happen to have the privilege of public office, um, need to change how we have those conversations. And that it's really not about just dealing with people with disabilities, but recognizing that it's about achieving the full potential of every citizen, regardless, and, and creating those conditions so that you can achieve uh, your full potential, um, and breaking down those necessary barriers so that you can get there. Mike. The, the, the experience in the U.S. of the Americans with Disabilities Act has become something of, to be feared by organizations, by ordinary citizens, because if you violate it, you're in trouble. We don't have that kind of experience here in Canada. People violate our human rights all the time, organizations, governments, via rail, airlines, and the only way that anything gets done about it is if somebody actually takes them to court. We need to actually have a Canadians with Disabilities Act in this country that everybody understands, that everybody applies for, uh, their, their lives to, and that is so well known in the country that the idea that nobody, that people don't understand what disabilities are will become a thing of the past. That's what needs to happen. It has to be so pervasive that there will be no misunderstanding of the, the rights of persons with disabilities in this country. Sharon. We learned to quit smoking. We learned to buckle up. We've learned to do a lot of things. How? Through public service announcements, through will through advertising. We can do this now in a digital world. We can through social media. We can do all kinds of, of, of announcements and education with quick little videos and all kinds of things that can really help to bring the awareness up. That's the answer. I think that's the easiest, the simplest, and most straightforward. Moderator's prerogative, a quick question, 10 seconds to each candidate to answer, starting with Mike. Regardless of the position of your party, will you personally commit to oppose the government ever using public money to create barriers against people with disabilities? Mike? Absolutely. We have a rule in my caucus that everything the government does, whether it's us or them, is d looked at through a disability lens so that we know whether or not we're creating a barrier and we're, we're opposed to ever creating another one. Sharon. Absolutely. There Ar is Arnold. Again, yes, but I, I have a, a, a caveat that I wanted to clarify. How would we know that? 
We'll talk. That's what the Canadians, Can Canadians with Disabilities Act that you got to get your party leader to commit to could help with a great deal. Uh, let's go to microphone number two, please. By the way, they didn't give me permission to ask questions. Sorry. Microphone number two, please. Hi. Uh, hi. My name is Gary Malkowski, and I am here as the president of the Toronto Association of the Deaf. In 1993 to 2006, the federal Liberal government has shown absolutely nothing in terms of a Canadians with Disabilities Act. From 2006 to 2015, the Conservative Party of Canada have too shown no leadership at all with the Canadians with Disabilities Act. So now my question is for each of you candidates. Will you go back to your leaders? Will you ask for a letter, an open letter, a commitment that call and actually call a press release and say that you will commit to introducing a Canadians with Disabilities Act? Sharon. So I, ask, I ask that of each of you and I ask for that to be in an open letter format and also with a press release. So does that commitment hold true for each of you and will you go back to your leader and I would hope to have a response by tomorrow. Sharon. <laughs> You're fast. <laughs> Absolutely. The Greens are committed, as I stated earlier, and I will, um, I, will, I will do my very best to get an answer for you by tomorrow, but unfortunately I can't guarantee it. But you can count on the fact I will work on it. Arnold. Um, I know that I'm the odd man out on this one. So I'd already said that to David that I would raise the issue with my leader. I, I cannot promise that it will be by tomorrow. Uh, we had the press conference and the press release today, and the open letter is actually winging its way to you as we speak. Very good. Microphone number one. Thank you. By the way, to Gary, back to microphone number one. Hi there. Um, I'm just over in this corner. My name is Patricia Kierens. I'm a master's student in critical disability studies at York University. I am an advocate of accessible on-demand taxi cabs, however, in my work I have discovered what may be a, literally, fatal flaw in modified accessible minivans, and I can share my research with you guys afterwards. Modifiers have had too much say in federal safety standards, to the point that crash tests post-modification are not required or provided for public scrutiny like every other car. I have been told on multiple occasions by them that they are crash tested, despite proof of the opposite. I'm going to ask you if you could just put a question Sorry. at this point, please. Is your party willing to revisit these standards and enforce safe, accessible vehicles the same as every other vehicle on our streets? Thank you. National standards require proper safety testing for accessible vehicles. Let's start with Mike. Absolutely. I sat on the uh, Transportation Committee in the House of Commons for the past four and a half years, and I'm astounded to find, as you've just said, that this isn't happening, but we've been astounded at how this government has treated safety over the past four and a half years, as you may well know. And we, we in Canada don't penalize car companies who are faced with recalls. They do in the U.S. We don't. We just let them kind of get off the hook. We need to, if, if this isn't being done, I will ensure that it is done. Sharon. Sure. Risk, at the risk of sounding like I'm going over the same old territory, remove this government, you remove the problem. We need to bring back regulations in everything so that, again, all things are fair, right, run right, are safe for everybody. Arnold. I join my fellow colleagues in just simply being astounded uh, that that would in fact be the case. I agree. I want to get three more questions in, so I'm going to change the rules slightly. Moderator's prerogative. The questioner gets 30 seconds. The candidates get 30 seconds. Uh, microphone. Was that microphone number two we were just at, or was that one? That was two? Okay, let's go to one. So my question actually is Bill Hiltz, it, this, this question, what will your party do in terms of supported decision making? 
Let's go to Mike first. Um, we have stated that we will remove Canada's objection to Article 12 of the UN Convention, which is on that very topic, and so we will in implement Article 12, including the safeguards that are necessary to ensure that that decision-making is independently verified. Um, Sharon. I'm sorry that I don't know enough about it to make a really informed uh, a comment, but I tend to agree with my colleague here that you have to build in safety everywhere. Arnold. I will have to join Sharon in that I simply don't know enough exactly the point that you're raising. Maybe you could come up and talk to the candidates after, give them some more information. Microphone number one, please. Hello? I am a Good evening, my name is Beverly Smith, and I'd like to inquire what each of your parties are going to do to truly get the boots on the ground and help people with disabilities. Uh, it's wonderful that you're going to address the Disability Act, and you're going to go in accordance, hopefully, with uh, United Nations and what they're bringing forth for persons with disabilities. But why should a person with a disability have to go through 10 different doors to get everyday service needs met? Why should we live in poverty? Food banks are not sustainable when you get uh, maggots in your potatoes. Why should an agency decide whether or not I need a foot pedal? And then I, I get a call back from my, eight, my worker saying, well, you know what, you've had the chair for so long. Obviously, people are suffering, people are hurting, people are in need, and it's great to hear about transportation being accessible. I can't even get on the subway car here because of the height of the subway car, and I'm told that after a year, the, car, the train will settle. Let's get real. People are hurting, facing needs, and has serious issues that need to be addressed. What are you going to do to ensure that these things are deliverable to the people and we are not nickel and dime any longer so we all can live in an inclusive society because if you have a template of accessibility and what it means in everything you do, have access for all. Thank you. What do you think of that? Thank Arnold. I, I, can, I can clearly hear your, your frustration. Um, all we can do is continue to keep pushing forward uh, to get the changes that you are advocating to be done. Um, I'm going to just simply echo Sharon's comment. Change the government. That's the starting point. Mike. Um, it sounds like a lot of what your issues are are with the provincial government. We have said we will work with that provincial government. We'll put pressure on that provincial government to actually live up to the Canada Health Act and once a UN Convention implementation plan is in place, and once the Canadians with Disabilities Act is in place, to force those governments to provide the services so that you're not going from pillar to post, so that you're not unable to access a, tr a transit vehicle. We need to make sure that as we build transit, we build it with universal accessibility, not just add-ons that make it accessible, but universal accessibility everywhere in this country and everywhere in this city. Sharon. I agree, universal accessibility, and I totally understand and hear your frustration. I get it. Uh, I've had to do, I've dealt with it myself, not for myself, but for others. An attitudinal change is huge, and every level of government needs to work together so that we're all coming off the same page doing the right yep, things yep. for everybody. Okay. Last question, and please make it super fast because our captionist has to be out of here right at 8 o'clock. Last question to microphone number two, please. So what specifically are your parties going to do to include people with disabilities in terms of consultation and that their, the lives of people in, their, in their, lot, their lived experience will be included? So it's not just hearing us here, but it's also including us on all levels. So what are you going to do to actually consult in a meaningful way? Sharon, then Arnold, then Mike. Uh, oh, there I go. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what to say to you other than doing what we are doing. We're wide open. We embrace. We Please, come forward. Uh, we're open. It's not like we're turning the door uh, closed on anybody or anything. 
you have to just go to the party that you want to work with or be with and put your name forward. And I really think that most of the parties here in Canada, other than the one that's currently running things into the ground, uh, feels this way. Arnold. The only ultimate way to, to make the difference is just to begin. Uh, and uh, you can see at least we've got three progressive parties sitting at this table that are prepared to work together to get to the place that you want to go. How do we make sure that there's accessibility? We have to make sure that we create the conditions that allow uh, those, of the, those of you who wish to participate in that consultation as this legislation comes forward uh, can do so. Mike. There's a list of about 170 different organizations on my desk as we speak that are those organizations that will be consulted with, there may be even more, as we develop the legislation, as we develop the practices, as we develop the UN implementation plan, and as we develop the uh, access to, to Canada, Canada Health under the Canada Health Act provisions. All those organizations and ordinary Canadians with living with disabilities will be consulted. We also in the NDP are the only party that has a committee whose only job it is is to pester me as the critic. Um, not the only job, they do lots more. They pester me as the critic to make sure that I am paying attention to all of the issues that come before me with regards to persons living with disabilities, that I have a disability lens and those individuals are wonderful and I appreciate all the advice I get. We will be consulting more than you've ever seen as we develop this new Canada that is going to be inclusive for all persons living with disability. Thank you for fabulous questions and apologies to those I either had to cut off or who didn't get to ask more. I'm going to ask the candidates to each make a one minute closing statement in the reverse order that they made their opening statement. So Sharon, then Mike, then Arnold. Thank you once again, everyone, for the invitation to participate here this evening. I hope I've been able to relay what the Green Party of Canada will do to serve the disabled community as you should be served. There's a tough job to be done in Parliament, and we need good people, together with Elizabeth May and other great Greens, working together and across party lines to address what needs to be addressed and drive politics back on the road of transparency, accountability, and full representation of all the citizenry. I promise you to give our very best to be transparent and approachable, and to bring years of advocacy and passion for the rights of the disabled community to be addressed swiftly and fairly, to not buckle under pressure and to always stand for the right thing. I thank you for your time. Mike. When Jack Layton asked me to be the critic for persons with disabilities, I went, wow. But I've put my heart and soul into it since May of 2011. And I hope I've done a reasonable job in, in representing all persons with disabilities over those four and a half years. Persons with disabilities deserve better than we are providing in this country. They deserve to be, to be able to feel that they are a part of the representation process that includes elections. They deserve to be part of the decision-making process that includes the creation of laws. They deserve to be part of the creation of accessibility platforms and accessibility norms in this country. And the NDP will do that. The NDP will include in all of its development of all the legislation, in the implementation plan, and in the, uh, in, in the development of standards and norms under those bits of legislation, all persons with disabilities and their representative groups. Thank you so much for coming here tonight, and thank you to the organizers for putting on what I found to be a very, very en enlightening and engaging debate. Thank you so much. Arnold. Let me simply echo uh, the comments of my fellow candidates that uh, I want to thank the organizers and most importantly all of you for being here tonight, particularly making sure that we have such uh, diversity in terms of formats so that uh, all of you can fully participate. There is simply much more work to be done uh, for all of us uh, who have the privilege of holding elected office. Uh, you've heard uh, the positions of each of the parties. Uh, I recognize that I probably have the most work to do among all of them 
in terms of moving my particular uh, party in embracing, um, for example, uh, uh, Canadians with Disabilities Act. But that's, I think, part of the process, and I think that's why these conversations are important. And so we will continue uh, pushing so that uh, we can ultimately create the conditions uh, that all Canadians uh, feel included, inclusive, uh, and ultimately barrier-free. Thank you. Let me thank the candidates, the organizers, and conclude with a couple of very, very brief points. Number one, be sure to vote. And to ensure that you've got accessible opportunity to vote, I strongly encourage you to vote at an advance poll. If you wait till Election Day and find out that Elections Canada has screwed up, you can't go back the next day. Vote at an advance poll. Number two, whatever be your political affiliation, use this election to press all the parties to make commitments. If you're interested, and number three, if you're interested in following or retweeting and mounting pressure to get the, all the parties to be unanimous supporting the Canadians with Disabilities Act, search on the hashtag Canadian number sign and then the words Canadians with Disabilities Act with no spaces. Thank you for the privilege of letting me moderate. Let me turn it over to Heather Willis. They can't hear you. Do you want this mic? a lot of time and effort to put together an event like this and on behalf of the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto and our uh, planning committee I'd like to um, first thank David Lepofsky uh, for his uh, amazing moderating skills and for being able to uh, pinch hit for us tonight um, baseball metaphor intended go Jays and David, I can't provide an update on the game because apparently they've been rained, there's been a rain delay. So you will get a chance to listen to the game yourself later. To our panelist candidates from the Dem New Democrat Party, Mike Sullivan, from the Green Party, Sharon Danley, and from the Liberal Party, Arnold Chan, thank you so much for being here tonight. A big thank you to our community partners, Access Ryerson with the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Alliance for Equality Blind Canadians, and Johnson Health Station, Arch Dis Disability Law Centre, Birchmount Bluffs Neighbourhood Centre, Canadian Disability Alliance, Canadian Hearing Society, Centre for Independent Living in Toronto, Citizens with Disabilities Ontario, Ethno-Racial People with Disabilities Coalition of Ontario, North Yorkers for Persons with Disabilities, Springtide Resources, and Toronto Association for the Deaf. In addition, I'd like to thank Access Ryerson for the webcasting, uh, Arch for providing the captioning, SILT for providing the attendance, and CHS for providing the sign language uh, interpreters. To our volunteers, you guys have been amazing. Uh, amongst a little bit of pandemonium, the, uh, folks with the blue shirts and the Ryerson SLC team, our Twitter team, uh, you guys have been terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, to the student, this, this beautiful space, we weren't sure how the accessibility here was going to work out. And uh, Tyler Webb and his awesome team of students and staff have just been incredible in uh, helping to deal with everything. So thank you to them. Um, and to our support personnel, attendance, ASL interpreters, and re our real-time captioner. But most of all, I'd like to thank uh, the audience participants, you, the audience participants, for such a tremendous turnout. Your presence is a strong indication that the importance of these issues of the importance of these issues to our lives and our future as participating, contributing members of society. Furthermore, the ability to have this type of forum allows us to explore and add clarity to issues that are not always straightforward. To the candidates, we sincerely thank you for taking time to be here tonight, allowing yourselves to be challenged on issues with which you may have previously been unfamiliar. Thank you for taking the time to inform yourselves. You're, it's, it's clear that you've done your research. 
There's a saying in the international community that goes, nothing about us without us. We hope you recognize the wealth of knowledge and lived experience in this room and the organizations represented here are a valuable resource to be drawn upon in the future. Each time we come together at a forum such as this, we are provided the opportunity for all of us, political representatives and disability community members alike, to gain a better understanding of the concerns that affect our lives, the barriers that impede them, and what can be done to address them. We encourage you to keep coming out. Thanks again for being here, and as David says, please don't forget to vote. Have a good night.